members. Welcome to the CP program on year end tax roundup and tips to take care before closing the books. Today we have CA Ishita Bomik from JA and Associates. I welcome you, ma'am. Started upon it with a four year before experience of 20 years in the handling multiple facets of corporate tax and regulated matters across industries. She is a partner in JAA since 2020. She has worked very closely with IT, ITS clients for evaluation and proactive planning around the formation test of tax holidays, business presence test, and advice for marketing entities in India, restructuring involving spin-off in tax neutral manner, business modeling and contract structuring, inbound and outbound movement of personnel, IP migration strategies, ETR managers across jurisdiction and providing complete solutions along with tax compliances. Her strengths include management of tax controversies before the first and second appellate tribunal, representation before tax authorities, managing demand and unlocking refunds, advisory on corporate restructuring, setting up of global in-house shared services in India for MNCs. Isita Ma'am is also a graduate in economics from St. Xavier's Kol Kolkata and also a course cost and box accountant. Welcome you ma'am. I would like now request uh, C. A. Raj Gopal sir to present a memento to Matt. Okay. 
So say for example, uh, one company has claimed unabsorbed depreciation in the, uh, sorry, in additional depreciation in the past, and there is unabsorbed depreciation as a result of that, it still can be claimed, okay, as a set off. So this is the advantage of this old regime, but the tax rate is little higher, it's 30%, okay. Minimum alternate tax is applicable, and if the MAT credit is eligible, that also can be claimed. On the contrary, this is the new regime, what we call, which is like the first one is no longer of area of importance, like at the option of the company, it can offer taxation as 115 BA. This was the erstwhile um, section which was providing a 25% tax rate, no longer area of interest because we have got the reduced tax rate of 22% now. So the first one is more or less irrelevant and nobody pays attention to it. The second one is area of interest, 22% tax rate. The only thing is, once you opt in, there is no looking back, there is no going back to the old regime. That's the first condition. Second condition, if there is anything brought forward, uh, unabsorbed depreciation or business loss, which is attributable to a tax holiday, that you cannot utilize. Okay? So many a times I face this question from the client, I will not opt in because I have loss. Then I come back and convince them saying that, no, you, that is not the simple solution. You look into the tax rate because if 22% is beneficial, let's go into that. And if the loss is not arising out of any tax holiday, there is no, uh, no restriction on setting that off. Okay? So that has to be cleared in mind, saying that there is no restriction in setting off if the loss is not attributable to any tax holiday. And the added thing is, under this regime, no deductions, no tax already. Okay? Just plain and simple, 22% uh, tax rate. The third one is even more important. At the option of the company, it opts the taxation under section 115 BAB at 15% rate. You, uh, all of us will remember sometimes back, Prime Minister was uh, you know, announcing Make in India concept, right? So Make in India is just to encourage the making in India, manufacturing in India and this particular section is in line with that encouragement saying that manufacture in India. Now when, when manufacture in India, it per se says it has to be manufactured, not a job work, not an assembly per se, it has to be manufactured and it's a newly incorporated company. If a newly incorporated company uh, manufactures and the company uh, company opts for taxation under 115 BAB by filing a particular form and by opting in the um, return by this section it can be taxed at 15 percent okay now there are little nuances in this because it's a very interesting 15 percent tax rate you need to keep some pointers in mind Existing company, can they set up a new company and transfer the business and say it's a newly manufacturing setup? No. Old wine in new bottle is not allowed. This is the age old concept of splitting profit transfer and splitting up reconstruction is not allowed. Right? So, any reconstruction, this tax benefit you will not get. This beneficial tax rate, I many a times colloquially call it a tax holiday because it gives a 15% tax rate, much 7% lower than the 22%. So any reconstruction, it will not be allowed, okay? Now if one existing company sets up a new company and sets up manufacturing facility, say for example, whatever is the existing company doing, it's one additional line of business. Will it be allowed? To my mind, yes, because it's new business. As long as you are not killing the old business and having a new line of business, new volume of business, you can prove that it's a new business. There are plenty of uh, decisions in case of 10 a 10 AA where this discussion is there, whether it's a reconstruction and splitting up, this kind of decisions have been held. So if that analogy is interpreted in the present section, you can jolly well say that existing company, let them do their own business. There is a new line of business. There are uh, some new manufacturing which is, which is required. Set it up in the new company and do it at 15%. But machinery should be new, business should be new, existing business should not be fed away. That's the golden rule. 
Now, under this company, will every income be taxed at 15%? No. It's only the manufacturing income will be taxed at 15%. The other income, what we call generally the passive income, the interest and uh, dividend or royalty, etc., that should be taxed at 22%, which is the general residual rate. How to exercise this option? You have to file a Form 10 ID before the due date of furnishing of the ITR. ITR has to be filed before the due date and it has to be, the form has to be filed. Can the option once exercised be withdrawn? No. Once you opt in, you have to be in this uh, section. For the, um, for the manufacturing income, you opt for 15%. For the, um, for the other income, you have to be taxed at 22%. What is commencement? Now, interestingly, all of us, we were uh, like uh, expecting, saying that this interim budget, the Honorable Finance Minister will extend the sunset clause by one more year. And, you know, everybody was keeping their fingers crossed and saying that the sunset clause is 31-324. Uh, the sunset clause means the uh, commencement of the manufacturing has to happen before 31st of March 2024. It was initially till 23. It was extended by one more year and everybody, the industry was lobbying saying that it should be extended for one more year which did not take place in this budget. So, alas, this is the sunset clause which is hitting in another month's time. Now, what is commencement? Now, one company can uh, probably has been set up and the plant and machinery is ready. Is it the commencement of manufacturing? They have to establish that the manufacturing has commenced. For example, if there is a test run, there have been the judicial precedents com commenting saying that yes, test run is commencement of manufacturing. There has to be one event which should say that yes, commencement has happened, right? So that is very important. Otherwise, this tax holiday is not available. And uh, the provisions of MAT is not applicable. All this new regime of taxes, MAT is not applicable, which is a very welcome uh, thing, so that the book profit is of no importance. There are sometimes the adjustments in the profit and loss account, which bothers people, saying that this is a credit. How will calculate the MAT? Because MAT will be affected. So this is not. Uh, uh, affected by MAT. Similar provision was introduced last year, budget 115 BAE. This is for the manufacturing cooperative societies established after 1423 uh, and uh, commencing uh, the manufacturing by 31st March 24. The similar sunset clause, 15% uh, rate of taxes applicable to this. Mm, finance minister's comment was that many people highlighted saying that it was only to the company and it's better to give it to the cooperative uh, societies also. So she extended it to another form of entity. Okay, but all other provisions are similar. ATIC, IAC. So being in Bangalore, we are very startup friendly. So all of us, we are day in and day out, we interact with startups. I'm sure all of you, we interact, you interact with startups. So startups are the entities who are registered, recognized by the ministry and they are certified, they are holding the certificate as startup for their uh, activities, recognition in the activities. So um, given that uh, in this budget, they have extended the uh, date for registration for one more year, 31st March 25. And um, uh, under this section, the startup may apply for the tax exemption for the, uh, can take the tax holiday for consecutive three years in a period of 10 years. That can be chosen. Earlier it was seven years. This is another interesting point. Tax rate for the foreign companies. You may ask why foreign companies will be taxed. Foreign companies are also taxed in India for their <coughs> presence. If there is a branch, that will be taxed at 40% for the activities done in India. Branch has to file a return in India and can claim the foreign tax credit in the country of residence. Okay? That's a formal branch. I thought I will just touch upon a few uh, minutes on the other informal presence also. 
uh, experience says that being in Bangalore, we see many multinationals having subsidiaries in India, and many people travel abro from abroad in India, and that can create a presence. So I thought I would discuss this in this forum, just to make aware that what kind of issues can arise. Typically, most of the companies in Bangalore, uh, India, what we see, we call the software hub, they are the subsidiaries of the overseas companies doing IT, ITS development. 70 to 80 percent of the cases are like that. There are few cases where the India are the promoter and there are overseas presence for marketing activities. But many are cases, India is a subsidiary. What happens, overseas entities, employees, or their directors or supervisors, they come and they stay in India, they do certain activities which creates permanent establishment for the overseas companies in India. Now, as per the treaty or as per the Income Tax Act, the permanent establishment or the business connection has to be taxed for the, for the profit which is attributed to that activity. Okay? One by one, the fixed place of business being. What is fixed place of business? It's just a small example. Overseas uh, companies, one employee comes to India, uses the Indian company's office or the conference room for a period of, say, six months, does the overseas company's business in a regular course in India. Do you think there is a fixed base? There is, a, there is a regularity in the activities. That person is using a particular permanent place for the purpose of business, right? So that will be resulting into a fixed place of business. And the tax authorities, if they investigate, they look into that matter, they, by law, they can conclude saying that it's a fixed place of business. Whatever activities are attributable to that, that place, that profit should be taxed at 40% in India. Yeah. Similarly, agency P. What is agency P? Overseas companies' contracts are in India. So all these companies, wherever, see, there can be Indian uh, companies who are their customers. This customer contracts, if it is concluded in India, for that somebody comes to India and concludes the contract, signs the contract, and interestingly, many of Indian treaties have the word securing contract. <coughs> now when something is secured in India, there is an agency PA created. Now this agency PA creation by securing contract is a very gray area. There are hundreds of decisions like what is securing, what is not securing, how do you prove it and how do you establish the evidence for this. But not going to that complication, just wanted to tell saying that the, if the agency PA is created, then profit can be attributed to that activity, right? So if some activities are done in India, Indian tax authorities should get a share of it. So that profit will be taxed at 40%. Attribution. Attribution to the PE profit. And service PE. If someone comes, someone is on the payroll of the overseas entity, comes to India beyond the threshold limit, say generally the threshold limit is 90 days or 90 days as per the treaty that person is in India, does pro is providing the service in India, <coughs> whatever it is, whatever kind of service, not the ancillary services, and that service, he is doing it on a regular basis. Yes, there is a service fee which is created, but there are countries where the service fee clause is not there, example Japan, okay? So there if a Japanese national comes to India and stays and renders service, the service fee is not triggered. So these are the things which probably people can keep in mind. If there is an overseas, overseas interaction, there is a physical presence in India, keep these things in mind and make sure you are not questioned by the tax authorities, hey, are you creating a presence for your overseas company in India? Okay? So just to flag off the uh, points which you should take care and keep a flag off in case the situation so demands. Few amendments to the previous provisions, 194A, increase in the threshold limit for cooperative societies to withdraw cash without TBS. So earlier it was 1 crore, now it is 3 crore, with a cut from 24-25 assessment year. 194R, 
so there was earlier a lot of discussion that uh, what is covered in this, whether cash or whether in cash and kind, whether mix is allowed, etc. There was a clarification provided and post amendment it is clarified that it will apply to non-monetary perquisites as well including part of cash also. So part cash, part kind also is included. 206AB and 206CCA, earlier when this was introduced, lot of you were cry saying that uh, non-resident uh, um, taxpayers or non-resident uh, people when they are transacting, how will they comply with it? They are not supposed to file return in India. So this has been uh, clarified saying that non-residents per se are excluded from this. 192A, TDS on withdrawal of EPF. If the recipient of EPF withdrawal does not provide his PAN, TDS on the withdrawal will be now 20% instead of the maximum marginal rate. Earlier it was maximum marginal rate. 194BA, TDS on the net winnings from online games. This was introduced uh, in last uh, Finance Act. TDS at 30% on winning from the online gaming is proposed without any threshold benefit. 197, the LDC earlier, the 194 uh, LBA was not allowed. Now that has been facilitated. If it is a case that LDC to be done, that has been included. 115A read with 195. This TDS rate has been increased to 20%. Earlier it was 10%. This is a clause which is very uh, widely discussed saying that the domestic tax rate is, you know, increased to 20%. We generally, um, we generally compare the domestic rate and the treaty rate and apply whichever is beneficial. There were treaties which were taxing the FTS and uh, royalty at 10%, 15%. 20%. So the domestic income tax rate ben was beneficial and 10%. We were adopting that rate, but going by this, this 20%, this is kind of hitting hard. Many a times, in the absence of the TRC, tax residency certificate, we cannot apply the treaty. That in absence of documentation also, we are falling back in this basket of 20%, which is hitting hard at the overseas uh, vendors. One more change which probably you can remember, not related to the uh, you know, withholding, but the section 115A requests you to file a return of income in India for the overseas company for the India sourced income. People many times ask saying that I do not have a P, I I do not have presence in India, I only earn P for technical service and royalty. Should I file? Answer is yes. 115A requests used to require you to file a return in India just to report the India source income and how much tax was paid or not paid, whether it was considered exempt or it was subject to a withholding tax. Now the change which has happened last to last year was that if the income tax is deducted as per treaty, you are still required to file a return. If the income tax is deducted <coughs> as per the Income Tax Act of India, then you are exempted from this requirement. So, if you fall into this 20% category, then no filing requirement. If you are under the treaty in a beneficial rate of 10%, uh, 15%, you file a return. And they have the right to look into the return and assess. Okay? This is a small nuance which is there. But still people follow in the treaty rate because that being the lower rate. Assessments, some changes. We are in the faceless assessment era. And in the last budget you may have heard that the finance minister has commented saying that as comment as um, compared to 2013-14, the return used to get processed in 93 days time. Now we have reduced it to 10 days of time, right? It's a very welcome move. Uh, there has been changes and there have been measures to make this viable. The assessments are faster, the appeals are in faceless appeals. So there have been certain measures which has been taken. The first one, creation of the new authority for appeals. The Commissioner of Income Tax, CIT Appeals was there, now Joint Commissioner, Additional Commissioner and 
a series of officers have been added. Just a little personal experience, I do handle many uh, you know, litigation support service, but my experience is the appeals are not getting disposed faster. It is probably picked up faster, but I'm not seeing a, like a resolution faster. So probably that can be a ask from our side, the practitioner's side, saying that may the resolutions be faster also, because that is the final intent of the uh, government, saying that a faster resolution, lower the litigation, etc. Then uh, specified authority for granting approval for issuance of notice under 148 and 148. This is also very technical, like who should grant the um, you know, authority to issue the 148. The reason behind this is left, right, center, there were uh, reassessment notices being issued. So it has been categorically told that who will issue the notices, who will give the uh, you know approval, etc. And there is a limit for issuance of this 148 notices. So all these are targeted to uh, you know streamline the litigation process, reduce the litigation to some extent, and at least make some uh, you know faster resolution if there are the litigations uh, uh, you know which is present. Time limits for 148 that has been reduced. Only if it is the income escaping assessment is very high, more than 50 lakhs, it can go beyond three, three years. So um, there have been the um, there have been the change in the uh, sections where it deals with the set off of the refund with the demand, and section 245A has been marched. The time limit for completion of assessment proceedings under 153, the updated return, that also has been announced. Time limit to furnish return under section 148. Earlier, the 148 notice used to mention this, and typically they used to give a 30 days time to file the return. And now it has been given in that that it can be filed within three months. There is an insertion of provision of section 244A which is defining that what should be the interest, uh, when should it be given, date of filing of the application of the uh, rectification application. There, there are penalty orders which are appealable now and this consequential amendments have been made to 155.11a to insert a reference to 10.8a to allow the assessing officer to amend the assessment order if the export earning is not realized within the permitted period. If you remember the erstwhile 10, 10A, 10 AA, so this was a very uh, you know valid uh, section saying that the export earnings should be brought into India. While it was there very categorically in section 10A and 10B, 10AA did not have this section, so that was a bit anomaly which got rectified now. Okay, 43B got amended for MSME payments to MSME, section 43B is now applicable on payments to MSME and deduction allowable only in the year of payment to the MSMEs. This is effective from 24-25, earlier the interest was under this. Uh, ease of claiming the deduction under section 30, uh, 35D. So a lot of uh, confusion what will be claimed under 35D that has been streamlined that what you have done what now the requirement of the approval by the board has been removed and the taxpayer has to just furnish a statement in the prescribed form and manner which has been there in the mm, income tax rules. So this is also effective from 24-25. As I'm mentioning it repeatedly, there have been measures to make life little simpler and easier and to reduce litigation. All we need is the implementation for this and so that things are uh, you know streamlined. Okay, 28.4. This is very interesting uh, amendment which has happened. Section 28.4 brings to tax the value of any benefit or perquisite, whether convertible into money or not, arising from business or profession. This is a contra amendment with 194N. Okay, we saw that, that uh, you know, what is included there. This is the contra entry in the recipient's hand saying that it should be included as by 28.4. Okay. Uh, it has clarified saying that the provision applies to all the cases where benefit of acquisite provided in cash or in kind, partly in cash or in kind. 
section 115 BBJ tax rate for online gaming we just discussed how it will be taxed 30 percent section 918 of that extended this deeming provision to the sum of money exceeding 50,000 uh, exceeding 50,000 rupees received by any non-resident person without a consideration should be taxed in India there's a little background to it it was noticed by the income tax authorities that many a times there have been the cases where um, you know the gifts it has been told that it's a gift by a resident to a non-resident without any consideration without any reason and that has been told that because it has been given to a non-resident it's not taxable in india because it's outside the jurisdiction of taxability so this section brings back the tax incidence to india saying that if it is paid without a reason without any consideration it has the right to be taxed in India there are few of such sections which has been introduced in 23-24 financial year with effect from 23-24 which is kind of anti-abuse uh, section and uh, you know it has been discussed very categorically saying that India has participated in the web section so through the web section it is uh, it is a welcome movement to participate in such reform reforming activities which is an anti-abusing provision saying there should not be a treaty shopping there should not be a base erosion for only for tax purposes we'll come more to it when we come to discuss the mli section 10 AA, return filing is mandatory to claim deduction we had goets india so after that it was a like a uh, like a passe but uh, this has been amended and said that to claim the deduction you have to file the return of income in india that supreme court very categorically told in goets india case section 10 22b withdrawal of the exemption to the news agencies not very relevant but just kept it here Section 115A, reduction in tax on dividend received by IFSC unit. This is a very interesting one, 48.3. Okay, though it is not for companies, just I found a place to keep it. So, um, uh, you know, uh, at the time of claiming the, uh, uh, claiming the loss from house property, the interest is claimed, right? Like, when you, when you compute your house property income, it's the nil value minus the interest what you pay on the housing loan and that loss is claimed against your other income and in the computation is filed like that, right? Now, the amendment says if you have claimed like that, you cannot claim it, claim it in the cost of acquisition. Many, uh, there have been many judicial instances where, where appeal has been filed to claim this interest portion in the cost of acquisition. It is now being categorically told that that cannot be claimed. Section 92D. This is the transfer pricing uh, you know, provision where the when the transfer pricing officer requires uh, the SSC to file the documentation, there is a time period given. Earlier this documentation given was 30 days time. That has been now reduced to 10 days time. So, we keep on advising to the clients saying that as soon as you finish the accountant's report, which is Form 3 CEB, complete the documentation also. The challenge what happens is completion of the documentation. Many times the, uh, the public database which is available, there the data for that relevant year is not updated that soon. So that is why you need little extended time to complete the documentation. By now, what is happening, the trend, because the transfer pricing officers want to finish the TP assessment faster, they require the documentation also faster. So that's a little challenge what is practical. I'm sure whoever is the practitioners here, they are also facing the same thing. The database is not updated that soon, but I'm sure like, the MC also will move along with the income tax authorities like the faster uploading of the database and faster availability of data. But net, net, we have to remember that the documentation if called for 
the, dip, the SSC has to submit it within 10 days time, <coughs> otherwise there can be penal provisions initiated. <coughs> this is for the trust. So now the, what has happened is the uh, registration under Section 12A has to be obtained prior to the commencement of the activities and claim exemption under Section 11 and 12. And Form Number 9A and Form Number 10 has to be furnished before the due date of the return of income. Earlier it was two months before the due date of the return. This 5627B is another anti-abuse provision. So earlier, under 5627B, only the residents were covered. From this year onwards, the non-residents are also covered. So what happens if there is a non-resident investing in a startup and there is a premium which is uh, being charged to the non-resident, earlier it used to get covered only under FEMA provisions and not under the Income Tax Act because 5627B was not applicable for non-residents, simple. But FEMA says that my FMB will be my floor. And so I can charge whatever on top of that, right? But because of this amendment, I have to justify what is the price which I'm charging to the non-residents. So if there is a startup which is issuing shares at a premium to the non-residents, they have to be governed by this section, no longer engine tax or any other valuation shield which has been given to the startups. So this has been widely discussed amongst this startup community and like there have been uh, you know, discussions, there have been discussion papers submitted, but it stays as is the provision. Okay. We discussed about the, um, you know, uh, the three years out of the ten years, the tax holiday, and this is the section which talks about the loss availability. Capital gains, the very important one is the third one, I will say, that exemption from the long-term capital gains on investment on the residential house under Section 54 and 54F is capped at 10 crores. Earlier, this cap was not there. This is one very uh, new thing which has come and which is from 23-24. This is not the income tax, but it is in combination with the MCA. So I thought we'll just discuss it. Uh, government has given a fast track merger proposition, uh, you know, to move this merger things in four or five scenarios, say, fully owned subsidiary or a very small margin, merger case and stuff like that, where there can be two companies merger done by the ROC and regional director and official liquidator. You need not go to NCLT. This provision was introduced quite some time back, but what was happening in practical, you know, because we face this kind of experience, saying that it used to take as long as an NCLT merger because the authorities are not responding to it. So what has happened through this <coughs> clarification and through this circular, they have put time limit to it, saying that within 30 days, within 60 days, if you do not get a response, then you consider it as deemed approval, okay? So the, uh, the legal um, the practitioners, they think that this will make life more simpler and the fast track merger will be actually a fast track merger. So if you have a merger in mind and if you see that that's a wholly owned subsidiary and a holding company merger, can opt for this fast track merger because now the time limits have been bound and it's been categorically told that within 30 days, within 60 days, this has to be approved and the documentation has to be done. Otherwise, it will be considered as deemed approved. If there is objection, the authorities are supposed to raise objection within that given time frame. Otherwise, it's deemed as approved, which is a very welcome move in my view. This is uh, some um, amendments which are available for the individuals. Major ones is the presumptive taxation. Earlier it was 50 lakhs, now it is 75 lakhs. This is also, uh, you know, there is a relief uh, to the individual professionals. So 
till 75 lakhs they are not subject to tax audit and they can just opt for this presumptive taxation. Common IT return has been introduced and um, <coughs> there have been certain funds which have been removed from the eligible funds that we have listed it here. That's just for reference. Employee taxation. Because we are discussing the companies who should, you know, what should be looked at at the year end, we are discussing the employee taxation also. <coughs> if you ask me individually, running parallelly the old regime and the new regime for the individuals, it's a bit of a burden, right? Do you also feel so? You know, if they want to simplify it, give a simplification and finish it off. Because every time, otherwise one individual has to evaluate whether old regime is better or new regime is better, okay? Think of a situation the employee has not told the employer saying that I will be opting the new regime. Taxes have been deducted at the old regime. At the time of filing you are saying that the new regime is beneficial and you are moving to the new regime. Poor employer has evaluated all those deductions and given you a relief or deducted tax as per certain things. Again you have to file for the refund and claim that refund. So instead like this is going for parallel. Though they say that the by default regime should be the new regime, so far it has not been implemented, but as of now it is parallel. So many a times employers give the option of evaluation of old regime versus new regime in the portal itself, their employee portal itself, and you can just check which is lower and opt for it. And their opt-in, opt-out opt is available for the salaried people, so that is how it is run in parallel. So this is kind of a uh, thing which the uh, companies should look into and uh, give the option to the employees to choose the regime and tax them accordingly. And no deduction is available. So another point is many times the salary structurings are happening by the companies saying that should we give this deduction, should we give that deduction. So under the new regime there are no deductions available. So all that just goes for goes for a toss. So it's just plain simple vanilla taxation and just give a standard deduction and tax it. Okay, this is a slide which just compares it like old regime versus new regime, what happens actually, whether old regime is better or new regime is better. And if you see that under the old regime you can claim the ATC, ATD, ATG, ATE, etc. But in the new regime, you can't claim all that, so the taxability is a uh, little higher. But at the lower income level, but at the other income level, it is you know the uh, new regime is. Uh, in in all these cases, if you see the new regime is giving a higher tax. These are the TCS which has been introduced. Again, this is kind of a reporting uh, thing which has been put to bring people in the tax net. It was uh, a data point saying that there are overseas tours people are taking but not filing return, not paying tax. There are people who are sending their kids and kin to abroad for education but they are not into the tax bracket to match, etc. So this is one measure which was taken to for to create a reporting uh, reporting net you can call it. So overseas tour package there will be when you remit for that there will be a withholding. There will be a withholding in case the money is sent abroad for education and any other purpose there will be a lower percentage of TCS. So this is effective from July 23 and uh, it has been well discussed and now it has been subtle practice saying that TCS will be there, consider that as per your 26 A's and claim that in the return of income. By this compulsorily it's making sure saying that people if they have to claim this refund they have to file the return. Multilateral instrument. So this is the point, again, India has taken as, uh, you know, a course of action in relation to the web section point. What happens, India has got so many tax treaties with so many countries. By signing up this multilateral instrument, by voluntarily opting for this, India is adopting saying that, yes, I'm party to it, so whatever countries I have done the treaty with, those 
treaties can get its stance amended. Okay. Now India has opted for it, signed for the MLI in 2017. MLI is the multilateral convention to implement the tax treaty related measures to prevent the base erosion and profit shifting. Sometimes back I was just mentioning that the country of source or the country of activities should get its fair share of profit. So if there is activity in India which is done just for you know for the sake of it or for the tax planning or for the tax avoidance so should that be disregarded okay so MLI modifies the application of this bilateral tax treaties concluded and eliminate the double taxation and it, it also implements the purpose test okay principal purpose test if principal purpose test is not satisfied the tax authorities get the right to disregard it Okay, so you may just keep it in the back of the mind while structuring a transaction or while doing a restructuring of the company if you are into that scenario. So make sure that the principal purpose test is followed, that there is a there is a substance to the whole matter. Let's discuss few pointers for the ITR. ITR has got <coughs> certain changes and certain disclosures over a period of time and uh, there have been some changes which are very welcome change it is making life simpler but there are some complications also involved in it so i thought let's put some placeholder to uh, you know few of the matters here icds adjustment so there have been the icds disclosures icds uh, standards which has been announced uh, sometimes back it's quite some time in the tax audit report that gets disclosed. So this disclosure is very categorically it has to be made. Always review this disclosure and see that what is getting disclosed. And the tax authorities when processing the return, it is just picking up the disclosures from this place and just adding it up here saying that this is the difference between the income tax books and the statutory books. So of late, last one or two years, we are seeing that whatever is disclosed in the ICDS disclosure, though it is disclosed just for the sake of disclosure, say for example IT depreciation, it is just getting added to the computation without even evaluating that what is there. So be very mindful that what gets disclosed in Form 3CD as ICDS disclosure. This is a very, very important thing. Last to last uh, week, we got a notice saying that we would like to do an adjustment to the computation in one of the company's case. This is the amount which is there in the Form 3CD as the fixed assets in ICDS. So should we not disallow it once again? And it's in cross the number. We figured out that is the book depreciation amount. Okay. And so they are saying that the book depreciation again will get disallowed just because it has been told in the IT depreciation in the ICDS saying that this is a book depreciation and this is a tax depreciation. Okay, so you have to be very mindful that what is disclosed in that those ten clauses. Otherwise, you will face the double disallowance. Uh, bad debts. Bad debts, if it is directly written off to the profit and loss account, that should be allowed as a claim, right? It is a very established practice. There are judicial precedents that it is the allowable claim when you write off directly. It's not a provision. Now, in the ITR, they require the data for if the amount is more than 1 lakh, they need the data of the PAN for the person for whom you have written off this debt. Many a times, the companies, if the amount is very big, they do not maintain this data, right? So at the time of filing the ITR, they, they are at a loss. So to give this clarification very categorically in the ITR, uh, since last year onwards we are suggesting that let the company maintain the data point categorically, that whose debt it is they are writing off and for that company. 
Provident Fund and other employee contributions. It is subject to a permanent difference if it is not paid on time within the due date. If you remember earlier to this amendment, if it is paid within the due date of the return of income based on the Karnataka government decision, it used to be allowed as an allowable expenditure. Now, after the amendment, if it is paid late, even by just one day or two days, it is considered as a permanent difference. It is not allowed as a deduction. Now, what happens if it falls into a, um, say, statutory holiday? Will it be allowed? What happens if the due day falls in a, on a Sunday? Okay? Yeah. You're saying something? Next day? Will the tax auditor, uh, you know, allow you to put that as next day? So, there are one or two decisions and there is a circular for bank payment saying that if there is a bank holiday, then it can be considered as a next day, etc., etc. But nowadays, the explanation given or the trend is, if it is on a statutory holiday, it's a known holiday. So why don't you pay the day before? Tax authorities are taking this argument. And, you know, of late there is an order where it is written, you know that this is a statutory holiday, pay it the day before. It is not allowed for the, you know, the day subsequent to that day. So it is disallowed. So sometimes this amounts are very big amount because of the employee PF and ESI and stuff like that. So one has to be very mindful if their due date falls on a holiday, what happens and just pay it and not have a permanent difference of that big because that disallowance hits. You, you can't claim it by any ways and means. This is another interesting area, forex gain or loss. Okay, a lot of litigation in this area. Uh, 43A has been introduced some times back. This also is another area where there is some attention required throughout the year to maintain the data. <coughs> what happens if you buy machinery through ECB or through, uh, you know, through a credit period or any other ways and means to guarantee by a bank or something like that? And you have some unrealized forex gain or loss, okay? or you have some realized gain or loss. So section 43A, this is this talks about the foreign exchange gain or loss on payment of acquisition of fixed asset from foreign country. It needs to be capitalized as part of the actual cost of the asset. So it categorically says that on realization, you capitalize this cost. So what I highlight and what I suggest uh, to people saying that maintain a very categorical data for forex. Make it divided into capital and revenue, realized and unrealized. It's just a four by four matrix, okay? So make it that way, realized and unrealized. And once you know that which is capital, you have the matrix as realized, unrealized. What is realized, you just capitalize. What is unrealized, you just take it forward it gets a place in your defer tax computation. What is revenue? What do you do to it? Realized and unrealized, you have to be categorically following a very consistent process to claim or to not to claim, okay? So you have to document that as a policy and then go forward with it. And you have whatever you are following with loss, you have to consistently give the same approach to gain. You cannot change the policy, okay? So there have been decisions at the High Court level or at the Supreme Court level which says that if you have followed a policy for loss, you can follow that same policy for gain. Say for example, loss you have not claimed, gain you may not offer. But loss if you have claimed, gain also you should offer. You cannot just be unfair to the treatment. So you have to keep it in mind and year on year you have to evaluate that what treatment you have given in which year, if it is a loss or gain, you may net it off the revenue one and give a particular treatment, but follow the treatment uh, you know, consistently, otherwise you will be 
have been a kind of a litigation saying that you cannot take differential treatment to differential years and do. Now what happens if you, uh, if you buy domestic assets through utilization of ECB? In this slide we just spoke about buying the uh, foreign assets utilization of ECB. Now here it is uh, ECB utilization of the, uh, you know, by buying a domestic asset. Nowadays ECB allows that. So what happens to the forex? Can we claim it? We can. There have been decisions to support this. So you have to keep a track of the utilization. <coughs> you have to keep a track whether it is a forex gain or forex loss, whether it's capital, whether it's revenue, whether the net is a credit or a debit, and then categorically set up a policy which you should follow year on year. There have been uh, you know, decisions at Supreme Court level, which is Woodward Governor, which is allowing this treatment. There have been decisions that have been mills and all, which are the Supreme Court cases, which are supporting this kind of view. All you have to do is you have to be following the practice consistently. This is kind of a um, very, very, uh, you know, uh, very uh, favorite topic at the hearing. Most of the people discuss saying that should we deduct tax, should we not deduct tax. This is just a provision. I am reversing it on the April 1. So if this is just for one day. 31st I do this provision and 1st of April I am going to reverse. Why should I do a withholding? So, uh, you know, it's, it's a very well discussed uh, provision. There have been a lot of case laws on this, a lot of litigation and by the tax authorities, by the, uh, you know, the TDS authorities, they impose 201, etc. Uh, to my mind, you have to follow a simple principle here. Is the pay identifiable and is the contract or the incidents for which you are making this provision is sure and certain. If you know to whom you are paying, there is no logic why you should not do a withholding, right? It has got a contra also. If you know the pay, that person also probably will be offering it to tax, right? So better you do a TDS and say that I'm paying this to this person and this is the withholding. But if you do not know, you do not know the PAN also, then the TDS will go to a suspense account. Then it is not benefiting anyone, right? So follow the principle saying that do you know the pay and is the payment certain? <laughs> Now another angle is, if the payment is not certain, is it unascertained liability? Will it be allowed under section 37 then? Because anything unascertained will also be evaluated as a business expenditure under 37. You may come out of 40 AIA saying that I do not have a liability to withhold tax. But what happens, you will be falling back into 37 and the allowability will be under question. So, you have to be mindful of this two particular provision. Now, the Karnataka High Court in case of Subex Limited, this is a case in 2017, it has held that no withholding tax liability or disallowance under 40AI will happen where the party is not identifiable in the year in provision is reversed in the beginning of the next year. There was a lump sum provision, the parties were not identified, they just knew that this much expenditure may happen may not happen, it just got lump sum amount got reversed in the beginning of the next month and Karnataka High Court, our jurisdictional High Court held that you need not do a withholding and it is not subject matter of disallowance under 40 AI. And this also was there in Biocom case by the value right act. But as I said, the crux of the matter is whether the parties are identifiable and whether the parent has got some certainty. That has to be evaluated firstly. Whether these payments, you may come out of 40 AI but be allowed under 37. Now if somebody gets disallowed under 37, this is kind of a permanent difference, right? You can't get it allowed immediately on payment because it is disallowed under 37 as a business expenditure, right? So you need to evaluate that which section getting the disallowance is beneficial under 40 AI or under 37. 
Remember, under 40AI, you have the implication of Section 201, interest also. There will be interest uh, element for non-deduction, short deduction. I just want to add one more point. There have been instances for, uh, you know, the TDS entries made later part of the year and it has been, uh, you know, just the TDS entries are done in the books, say on 31st March or something. So what it conveys, saying that you have done the tax deduction in 31st March, you are doing the entry in 30th of September, from March to September you have not remitted the tax. What does it convey? It conveys you have kept the treasury money with you from March to September, which is a criminal offence. Not only interest applies, there have been the cases where department has issued the summons and the prosecutions. Okay? So, have to be very mindful of the serious provisions making in the books at a past date for a, you know, for one entry which is coming as an audit closure entry. Always suggested that you, when you pass the entry, you pass the TDS entry at that point of time. It may result into a late deduction, but it doesn't call for a penal provision. You will be subject to interest, but it will not result in a summon and a prosecution. So be mindful of when you are passing the TDS provision entry in the books. It should not result into a matter saying that the TDS money, that the treasury money is kept in the company. It's a deduction at a past date and remittance in the very later date. That is the reason I just mentioned the dates here, that the 30th April, that the TDS deducted in the month of the March shall be paid by 30th of April. If the deductor is in government office, then the TDS payment shall be made by 7th of April. TDS return shall be filed by 31st of May. And in case of audit entries, as I was mentioning, that be very mindful that any entry is made after 31st March, just have the TDS uh, consequences and the interest consequences on those TDS entries. Now, TD, uh, the disallowances under 40 AIA for the you know the domestic parties that can be avoided if it is paid before the return of filing the return of income. Uh, the Finance Act 22 has enabled the uh, filing of the updated returns by uh, up to two years. Now, this updated returns, you have to evaluate whether you should file it or not. You cannot claim a refund of taxes paid. You can only add the you know the tax liability. So evaluate and see whether the return updated return should be uh, considered for payment. But because the revised return window is uh, you know reduced just towards the end of the uh, you know assessment year, and now it is till December. Like for March 23, the revised return could have been filed only by December 23. So the revised return window is very short. The only option given is the updated return in case there is some element of income which needs to be offered by filing an updated return. Okay, And uh, for this updated return, the additional tax liability is there. And updated return assessment also, they have announced the time limit for it, that when the updated return should be allowed. So for 139A, the updated return for 2021 has to be filed by set 31324, which is this March. So if you have anything to consider for financial year 2021, which is getting time barred by this March 24. So with uh, this, I then uh, just present the tax calendar also. Tax calendar, the specified financial transaction is for 31st of May, that's the uh, due date. Before that, that has to be filed. The tax audit for the uh, non-TP cases has to be filed before 30th of September. For TP cases, it's one month additional, 31st of October. Return of income for uh, no TP audit is 31st of October. For the TP cases, it's 30th of November. Form 3CEB, which is the accountant return, which is 31st of October. 3CEA, the master file. And 3CEA is also 30th of November. 
So this is the tax calendar and we all are like well versed with it. There is no change. There have been some changes in the COVID period, some extended due date was been given, but now it is like all settled since last one or two years uh, it's been followed. Last year it is followed. 22 there have been some extension what we have seen. For 23 there have been no extension. Uh, for the charitable trust, tax audit and 10B and 10BB, these are the uh, you know, forms which I mentioned that there have been some changes. Earlier it used to be uh, you know, given like two months in advance, but now it is along with the um, uh, return of income day. ROI for the charitable trust is 31st of October and individuals are 31st of July. Now there have been these forms which request to be filed, this 10IE, 10IC and 10ID if you opt for the beneficial uh, rate of tax. Say for example for the new regime, if you opt the new regime of tax, you need to file this 10IC. What happens if you do not file the 10IC? It's like that 56F not filed with 10 AA. So if you do not file this form by clicking that option in the portal, <coughs> department has the right to disallow the new regime and can push you back to the old regime. And if you think that your tax liability is lesser in the new regime, they can push you back to the old regime and uh, disregard your uh, you know, option made. This form is to be filed before the return. If somebody misses it filing along with the return, then there is a challenge. Though the portal has accepted a late filing and stuff like that, Categorically, technically, the department they may disregard any late filing of this form. Okay, So though it is a procedure, it is very important to opt for this regime and file this form. This is just a simple declaration by you are applying this, uh, you know, uh, opting for this regime and you need to file for this. Now, uh, can, with the, in the absence of this form, can somebody disregard uh, the claim of the new regime in the, and the lower taxability in the return? Can this be, uh, can this be argued? There is the Goetz India case which uh, is decided by the Supreme Court saying that if a claim is made in the return of income, the assessing officer should consider it. And there have been cases which says that if the Form 56F is not filed in, uh, I'm just trying to draw the analogy for the tax holiday, if the Form 56F is not uploaded along with the return of income, so by mistake or by any technical error, it's only procedural, but the return of income has to make the claim. Now in this particular case, say for example, return of income has a claim, but you have not filed the form. So you can probably draw some analogy from those cases and say that it's a procedural and the return should be you know, considered. But department has every right to disregard that argument because the section categorically says that this form has to be filed before the return of income. Though it is procedural, it the has to be The new regime is the default regime, no? Sorry? The new regime is the default regime, no? No, new regime is not the default regime. You have to opt for, for it. For financial year 23-24, new regime, uh, new regime is a default regime. And we have to file form 10 IEA if you want to go for old regime. It will be, it will be the default regime, but it has not been pushed so far like this. You have to, you have to file the 10 IC if you have to opt for the new regime. Okay. 10 IEA. Individual. For individual IEA. Oh, individual IEA. Yeah. For individuals, new regime is the default regime. Already. Okay. So, so I'm talking about corporates. So we need to file the form again when I when it is the default regime. It is better to file. No, the there is section. No form 10IE now. It is 10IEA, which has to be filed if you want to opt for old regime. If you want to opt for old regime, old regime. yes. There have been the questions whether we file these forms year on year or we file it year one, it accepts for all the years, right? So that discussion also was there. When the new regime came, so if you have filed for say 22, the new regime, do you file it for 23 once again? Correct. So you just give the acknowledgement number of the first year return and say that I have opted for the old regime. So that kind of question also crops up that whether you file it year on year basis or you file it only on the year one.
that's it. I think I finished before 10. <laughs> if you have any questions, happy to take it. Suppose there is an individual under presumptive taxation, but doing 100% service of export from entity foreign. So transfer pricing applies, form 3 C E B applies. If it is related, related party. party. He is applying, uh, giving to a related mm -hmm. party. Then what is the due date? He is under presumptive taxation. Transfer pricing pushes the uh, due date to the uh, 31st of October. CBC doesn't allow this. is taking to 31st July by default to the software. In because their contention is if you are applying transfer pricing, then presumptive ideally should not be there for you. That's technically no. CBC is telling us 31st July.
unless and until the provisions are made, they will not say that the expenses are categorically stated, right? None of the auditors will accept that. So you have to make the provision. You have to just decide whether you should do the TDS or not do the TDS. Probably not making the provision is not a, uh, not an option. So make a provision, reverse the provision, and get the GST bill with. Then we can claim claim the GST in 2000. That's say if my audit fees is one lakh, and I I will raise only after doing the audit one lakh plus eighteen thousand, one lakh eighteen thousand. Only after I, I give the invoice, they will take the input tax rate, eighteen thousand. Okay. And they will give a credit to my account one lakh eighteen thousand. They will deduct ten thousand and balance they will make the payment. If how do I uh, how did uh, the company expect me to give a bill of one lakh eighteen thousand to make a provision of one lakh eighteen thousand at the end? The so and, and, and how do they deduct TDS? The liability to pay audit fees arises next year when audit is completed. No, but the provision says it's accrual or credit whichever is earlier, right? Credit payment whichever is earlier. So the three categories have been given. So you are into that accrual category. You are not in that payment category. So we make the provision or not deduct the TDS. <laughs> <laughs> well, without GST, I have an Indian subsidy. The foreign parent company has been taken over by another foreign company. They may arise a capital gain tax. Now it's for capital gain is for the parent company. How to go? Because the Indian company subsidiary need not pay the capital gain tax. No. But how the Indian company subsidiary people can uh, safeguard their interest? Because if something happens, if they don't pay, whether these people will be held responsible directors? So there have been provisions which has been introduced after the indirect transfer provisions have been introduced in the Act. And there are the annual <coughs> provisions of the withholding uh, matter on the capital gains. Even if there is a NR to NR transfer, in case the transfer is arising out of the Indian asset, yes. there is a capital gains which yes. is accruing in India. Yes. There will be that this tax liability in India that in our company is supposed to withhold tax and pay the tax in India, right? So they have to get a tax and they have to report this in India. So they will get a tax number and... That, that is theoretically what you say is correct. correct. Look at practically. <laughs> Both are pair, foreign companies. They will not come and tell me the, what is the tax liability. Indian company as a subsidiary, the Indian company per se is not bothered. No. But when the tomorrow, tomorrow the directors can they can say that the directors are responsible for not payment of tax. Can that happen? May happen. They will get the So how, how does these Indian directors can safeguard their interest? Because they may be here today, they may not be there tomorrow. Once it gets closed up, practically. Theoretically what you say is that. But how to go over practically? Because first they need to take a path. Because the moment you get the information saying that this shareholding is getting No money gets transferred. transferred in India, it's all happening in abroad. That's true. But as an Indian company, you will know that your shareholding is getting changed. Yes. The moment you get this information, you safeguard your interest saying that you tell them what is the Indian law when there is a change in shareholding even though it is NR to NR. Right? What are the filing required to with RBI? What are the filing required with NC? You tell them and they have to take care of it. If they do not take care of it, it's there. they will get the penalty notice or other notices. I am not but, bothered about what they may get. But How you do I safeguard my state? You, in, you inform them about the Indian Income Tax Act or the FEMA provisions and all. You will not be liable yeah, for a penalty. Just by informing whether I can get over the liability tomorrow. Liability is not a new. No, I know, sure, but they may help me as well as being an indirect director. On what capacity? You are not the director of the overseas company, right? You are yeah. the director of the subsidiary company. And you can send So you mean to say that just by communicating, I can keep a record saying that I have communicated if they are not for the NC. Unless you are holding any representative SSE or representative no, of the or the power of attorney or anything from there, no. you may you know, say that you are not responsible for their compliances. They have to do their compliances. Thank you. Overseas debt. The overseas debt. The overseas debt. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't get the question. Overseas debt. Not realized. Overseas debt. Not realized. 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 Not real
What document? Document. Document. Okay. 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 It is uh, the pan is mandatory if it is more than one. If it is a non-resident, you have to give it black, right? There is a new form, uh, form number 71 introduced in last October for any areas adjustments. Uh, for financial year uh, 2023, uh, the time limit for revision is lapsed, 31st December. So now can I file that form and uh, uh, you know make any adjustment in my TDS uh, claim, whatever I had claimed in my uh, Say for example, I had claimed a higher TDS, not uh, taking proportionate uh, uh, credit. If the income is uh, uh, you know spreading across next year, I did not claim that proportionately. I had claimed full uh, TDS. So now there was a disallowance and the time time for revision is elapsed. So now can I file form 71 and make that adjustment and request the officer to uh, allow the proportionate credit so that I can carry forward for next year? It may not be enabled because it has to come through the return of income. But the return of income, that window is lapsed. Yes. yes. So they may not uh, consider this only. No, but the 71 is meant to be for uh, adjusting uh, True, the TDS, but right? uh, they, will, they, I'm just trying to be a devil's advocate. They may probably argue saying that this has to come through the return of income because the claim has to be driven from the return that what is the income you are offering and what is the TDS you are claiming. So that, that may be of anomaly, but you can try 71 if it is accepted. Just like I was telling, you know, 10IC, it was accepting in the portal, so you know, someone filed it. So you may try it. It's all you may try. But this may be the argument. Thank you so much for patience.